An announcement before we start, um, Jennifer Traver, who's here, who is the support group leader and from Monroe, is going to say uh, a couple of things before we get started. Thank you. I just wanted to take a moment to um, let everybody know my name is Jennifer Traver. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease three years ago at 42, and I knew shortly after I got diagnosed that I wanted to um, reach out in the community and find support. And I just wanted to give a heads up to the Michigan Parkinson's Foundation for having a great resource with the support groups that we have around Michigan and in the UP. We have 71 groups available to everybody. And I know that it can be overwhelming and maybe scary if you're on the fence about checking out your local support group, but it also can be very beneficial. It's not a woe is me meeting. We don't sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. It's, um, I know I make my meetings about um, researchers that, I'm sorry, guest speakers that come in and I try to make it educational, supportive, and just there for all of us. And you become a family camaraderie, 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 I can never say that word. But anyway, if you're, I'm not here to push anybody. I know it can be scary, but I don't want it to be a scary thing for you. And if you're on that fence, just check out your local support group. Go to the website, the Michigan Parkinson's Foundation. Make sure you check out what's local in your area and make sure that you just give it a chance. It might be very beneficial for you. So we're going to go on next to talk about mental health, health issues. You heard a lot this morning about the fact that having Parkinson's disease predisposes you to depression or anxiety, and now we're going to hear how to deal with that. Our speaker is Dr. Barbara Fisher, who is a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist. Um, she completed a sleep fellowship at JFK Neuroscience Center in New Jersey. Um, under a movement disorder neurologist. She's been involved in the treatment of dementia and aging for about 20 years. She's the clinical director of United Psychological Services, a complete care facility providing psychological as well as uh, therapeutic services across the age spectrum and psychiatry. So she's here today to tell us about coping with anxiety depression and sleep issues and i would imagine that these th are things that involve almost all the people in the room so i think this is a very important topic and we certainly welcome her thank you Thank you, and I want to start by saying thank you to Mary Sue, who's been wonderful in uh, making all of this happen and certainly helping me to get from point A to point B and be, be before you today. And also, uh, just to thank you for the opportunity to present the different things that we're doing that's actually very exciting. So, um, I am in a wonderful position because everybody has already explained to you about Parkinson's and they've already told you about anxiety and depression and sleep disorders, so you already know uh, that the topics I'm going to be covering uh, have an impact upon Parkinson's, or vice versa. Uh, so basically, just to start, I'm going to be covering the non-motor symptoms. Those are the biggest issues that are involved. And the, uh, the idea is to be mentally sharp. Uh, we know that 98.6% of uh, individuals diagnosed with Parkinson's have more impairing non-motor than motor symptoms. And of course, the research has been focused on motor symptoms, but it's beginning to really become focused on the non-motor. We can't see you. Can oh. You want me to advance your slides for you? Um, no, actually, I'll do it with this then. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so basically, 70.8% uh, 70 of those diagnosed with Parkinson's have the non-motor symptoms. Uh, as you, we've talked about already, the early warning signs are olfactory dysfunction, constipation, and RBD, REM sleep behavior disorder, that I'll be talking about more in depth. Uh, older patients are more likely to have uh, non-motor symptoms before the motor symptoms, while the younger patients are more likely to have the motor symptoms uh, before the non-motor. Uh, the neurocognitive deficits are memory and executive reasoning. Most common uh, emotional issues are anxiety and depression. There's changes in sleep and eating, personality uh, changes as well. And so the end result, of course, is that uh, 
um, Parkinson's is now being seen as a neurocognitive psychiatric disorder. So what are the objectives of this seminar? A call to action. That basically there are modifiable risk factors that you can take to make a difference in your daily life, no matter what stage of Parkinson's that you're in. And so we're going to talk about anxiety and depression. We're going to talk about mindfulness. And I was at a, uh, a neurology seminar earlier this year, and they're starting a mindfulness uh, group for uh, Parkinson's. Mindfulness is really emerging as a way to move through uh, some of these disorders that affect us where we don't have a lot of control over and to give us a sense of control. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of sleep, Separating out the dementias, Lewy body versus a dementia that is very specific to Parkinson's that we've been tracking. And then, of course, case studies that we're really, really excited about is that we're actually bringing back memory function and um, bringing back in fun uh, function in all different areas uh, and have been having very, very good results with that. So Viktor Frankl talked about the meaning of life, and, and, and what he said was that you need to transform a personal tragedy into triumph, to turn one's predicament into a human achievement, that we can find meaning in life no matter where we are. And the idea is to take things where they are at the time and no matter what stage, and to try to remain positive. Resilience is the ability to spring back into shape, elasticity, toughness, to recover from difficulties. And that's really what you're looking to do at, at any stage of Parkinson's. So let's talk about depression. Well, depression is a big cloud that hangs over your head. When people are angry, they're depressed. Now, when we see people that are angry, we don't think of them as being depressed, but it's the same energy. So anger and sadness are the same energy. So we see, when we see anger, that's depression. It can be a genetic passed down from generation. As you've already heard, you can have depression stemming from Parkinson's, and you can have depression stemming from some of the therapies, and you can have depression just from dealing with life with Parkinson's, and you could have depression from a genetic disorder. So it's thinking in a very negative manner, predicting, expecting the worst. It's not positively motivating. People want to remain in bed. They want to stay in their room. And then the less that you go out, and the more that you stay in your room, we're not doing that exercise that everybody has already talked about that is becoming uh, more neuroprotective as well as helping uh, with all different aspects. So life is no longer exciting, and waking up is hard to do. So these are the symptoms of depression. This is from the Beck Depression Inventory, and basically you have all kinds of issues. You have sadness, pessimism, past failure, loss of pleasure, and you can read all of these, and you have these um, in your handout as well. And again, those are, so if you're asking, well, what is depression? This is, these are the clinical signs of depression, and again, that's from the Beck Depression Inventory. There are physical symptoms of depression as well. Poor sleep, we all know that sleep and depression are married and they interweave with each other. Appetite increases or decreases, loss of energy, being tired, and you have to separate that out from the fatigue of Parkinson's, as well as ruling out other factors that could be going on um, that create that symptom. So what is anxiety? Anxiety is nervousness. Anxiety is being tense. And if you've ever had anxiety, you can kind of feel that in the tension uh, in somebody's voice that's there. It results in uh, uh, an autonomic nervous symptoms. And when that happens, it can lead to a panic attack, where you go to the emergency room and you feel like you're dying, and you've got all these physical symptoms going on. And the doctor says, I, I think you need to see a psychiatrist, because it looks like it's panic. So, what happens with anxiety is that, whoops, let me go back, uh, is that it innervates the sympathetic nervous system and takes on a life of its own, and then you have physical symptoms as well as emotional symptoms. And we all know that anxiety and depression overlap for many reasons. So if you're depressed for a long time, you're going to be anxious. If you're anxious for a long time, you're going to be depressed. So what are the emotional symptoms of anxiety? Unable to relax, you think of the worst happening. And part of what goes on is that when you have these symptoms of depression and anxiety, 
Your thinking changes, and you get into that negative thinking. Same thing is true of anxiety. You anticipate the worst happening. So if someone, someone comes up to you and says, I want to tell you about this, and you go, what? Because you know, you're already expecting the worst case scenario. So when you have a lot of anxiety and depression in it, and it becomes internal, then we, we end up in the spiral where we're thinking the worst, predicting the worst, getting anxious about it, and it goes on and on from there. So this is a pie chart which shows you the blue area is all the things that we anticipate we're going to be worried about. But the pink area is the things we actually really need to be worried about. So the physical symptoms of anxiety can move into a spiral. And basically, you've got the numbness and the tingling, feeling hot, wobbliness. These are all symptoms that you can see with a panic attack, shaky, feelings of choking, feeling faint. And again, it circles around. And so when you have those symptoms or you have a panic attack, then you're afraid of, of having another panic attack. And so symptoms spiral into each other. So in comes mindfulness. So what is mindfulness? And you may have already heard of that before, but basically it's the idea of just stopping and being in the moment. Most of the time, we live life in the past, what has already happened, or we live life in the future, what we anticipate that's going to happen. And so an example is eating. So if you've ever gone to a restaurant where you're looking forward to a specific meal or food or whatever, like if you like whole belly clams and you're going to Boston to this one restaurant, and you take this first bite and you go, wow, that is just amazing. And then you don't even think about it because then the food is almost gone and you're on your last bite and you're like, you just ate mindlessly. And so mindfulness is really being aware and staying in the moment and enjoying what we have in the moment. So the focus is on taking suffering, and suffering is one of the things that we all have. You know, we're jealous of other people. Oh, they look like their life is easier. Everybody looks like, you know, they're on the other side of the fence and, and things are going better. And so we, we, so suffering is all about, you know, feeling sorry for ourselves and why am I in this position and why did this have to happen to me? This didn't happen to so-and-so. And mindfulness takes that and says, let's look at that from a different perspective, that we don't have to have that define us. So is your mind full of all kinds of stuff going on, which is my example about eating, that, that we, we just race through our food and we're not, or are you mindful of what's happening at the moment and what's going on with your body, that mind-body connection and how you're feeling? And so it's about suffering and it's relief. It's an active process that engages the person in life in the present moment. It's relational, relating your mind and your body connection. And when you feel better, you're nicer to people. And when you're nicer to people, they're nicer to you. And so it kind of circles around. So it activates our understanding and, and wisdom, requires courage and commitment, and just curiosity. So instead of being emotionally reactive to what's going on, you're like, hmm, you're curious about things. So the practice of mindfulness is being forgiving to ourselves, self-talk. Have you ever just, in, if anybody has ever, where you tend to, talk negative to yourself. And so something happens and you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. And then you say, oh, I can't believe I did that. And how could I have done that? And you're going on and on in your brain about you can't believe that you did something. And somebody gives you a compliment and you're like, well, yeah, but it's not so good because I did this. And so we always have that negative self-talk that's going on. So mindfulness is about, you know what, we don't have to be critical of ourselves. Learn from the experience and move on. We don't have to live in the past. We don't have to live in the future. It's about living in the moment. Learn from the experience and move on. So again, um, it's the idea of uh, being kind. If there's a mistake, just let it go and build up the muscle of self-compassion. We're often nicer to other people than we are to ourselves. So it's working through that freeze and forget it stance and that we become more aware of what's going on around us. So we're living life in the moment. 
So this is just a chart to show you. We have fight flight, we get scared, and, and, uh, and we get afraid of things, and then we say, forget it. Um, we freeze and say, forget it. Or we attend, and we're mindful of what's going on, but we don't have all of those emotional reactions to what's going on. So mindfulness is something you have to practice all the time, because it's not easy. It is not easy to stay in the moment. It is not easy to not think about the past and not think about the present. And it takes a lot, a lot of practice. And so we're often not aware that we have choices in responding. So one of the things with mindfulness, and there's a bunch of different things, you know, there's all kinds of uh, physical exercises, mindful walking, body scans, how, what's your body feeling right now. But an, e an easy one is to just go stop, pause, let me take a minute and rewind, regroup, and just be curious about what's happening at this time. Open and observe, and then proceed. So there are different methods to relax. So one of the methods is you tense and relax each group. So you go through all your muscle groups. You, you, know, you tense your neck and relax your neck. You tense your arms and relax your arms. Another one is, as I said, that, that uh, body scan that's there. A mindfulness body scan is going through each body part and saying, oh, I'm feeling this, okay, and then, and then moving through each uh, body apart. And another one is self-hypnosis, which I've actually been doing for over 20 years. And I've given you some slides on how to do your own self-hypnosis, but the idea with self-hypnosis, and, and again, it's not one of those anybody's going to turn into a chicken or anything like that. <laughs> The idea with self-hypnosis is to just take some deep breaths. We don't breathe from our belly. To breathe from your belly, take a deep breath and breathe out. And you do that three times. And then what you could begin to do is count to 10 as you're slowly breathing and unwinding and relaxing yourself. And so you can either do that just yourself in your mind, or you can also make a tape and do that. And what it does is it really takes you into a deeper state. And you can do that before you go to sleep. It's very, very helpful with pain control. And it's very helpful in just relaxing at any moment in time. So these are slides that you can use. This is one of the things that, that I do um, with people. And it just kind of tells you what you can say to yourself. So we've talked about anxiety. We've talked about depression. We've talked about mindfulness, having a, a good attitude towards things, and getting out of the past, and not thinking about the future and staying in the present. And now we're going to talk about sleep. And so sleep, we all know, is very, very important. And we also know that 80 to 90 percent, as you've already heard today, of individuals who have Parkinson's have some sort of a sleep disorder. Uh, we're looking at um, REM sleep behavior disorder. Those are vivid dreams. I'm going to talk about night terrors as well, or nightmares, uh, vocalizations in sleep. We're now looking at uh, REM sleep behavior disorder as anything that breaks through the atonia. And with REM sleep behavior disorder, it's a disorder that happens in REM. REM is your dream sleep. And during that time of REM, you're dreaming. Now, you're dreaming that you're running, but you're not running because you have what's called atonia. And so you have no effort to move. But what, when, what happens with RBD is it breaks through the atonia, and all of a sudden you're moving. And so people can fall down the stairs and have accidents and things like that, and of course, acting out their dreams. 30% of men um, are with RBD. We see more men than women. And then restless legs, I had the opportunity to train with Dr. Art Walters, who's very involved with restless legs, um, can be another issue. So you can have restless legs um, because of low ferritin or low iron levels that you've already heard today. It can be genetic. It goes hand in hand with ADD, uh, ADHD. And you can also have it um, um, as a result of the Parkinson's itself. And then also obstructive sleep apnea that you've all already heard today. And we all know that obstructive sleep apnea does affect your memory. It is one of the risk factors for dementia. And it's very important um, that we address that. And so snoring is not OK. I can't tell you how many people I, 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 hear, I talk to and they say, oh, I thought snoring was OK. Everyone in my family snores. But by the time that you're snoring, snoring is the sound of breathing in an airway that has already narrowed. So it's the sound of breathing in an airway that's already narrowed. So by the time you're snoring, it's a done deal. That airway has already narrowed. And the louder that you snore, 
the more you're at risk for sleep apnea. So going back there. So we're all supposed to get eight hours. That's what we're supposed to have. And basically with sleep, um, more sleep is in stage two. We lose three and four. Children have about 40% of slow wave sleep, but as an adult, it drops down to 15 to 25. And 20 to 25% of REM your dream sleep is stable through the lifetime. So the big deal about sleep is process S and process C. Process S is if you have a duration of time that you have not slept well or have gotten little sleep, you're going to be more sleepy. The circadian rhythm is your body clock, and you also have clock genes throughout, throughout your internal organs. And basically, it means that we're all tired uh, in about 11 or 12 o'clock, core body temperature drops, melatonin kicks in, and we are ready to go to sleep. My slides are advancing all without me. And uh, we're ready to go to, you get the preview, we're ready to go to sleep. And, uh, and so as a result, if you have a situation where you, you have your afternoon, mid-afternoon, you have your sleepy time where your core body temperature drops, and at the same time you haven't slept, that's when all the car accidents take place and the plane accidents and the boat accidents, that, that three to five o'clock uh, sleepy time. So our sleep architecture is that you have five periods of, uh, periods of REM that are more towards the latter part of the night and early morning, and you're supposed to be going from stages one, two, three, and four and up to sleep. But if you have a lot of arousals, whether that be due to anxiety, or you have arousals due to sleep apnea, um, or arousals due to uh, restless legs, or some other type of reason, uh, you're going to, your, your sleep isn't going to look like this. It's going to be more choppy. And we have 90 to 120 minute cycles of sleep. So when we're looking at sleep, and this affects Parkinson's, this affects anyone, uh, basically, you have issues of, uh, again, restless legs, periodic limb movements, um, advanced sleep phase, uh, and sleep-disordered breathing, poor time management, cognitive symptoms, insomnia. We're going to kind of cover all of these issues. So the whole purpose of this slide is just to tell you about slow-wave sleep. As I said, it does decline when, you, when we get older. Uh, it tends to uh, decline more in men than it does in women with the ages. Arousals increase through time. So as you get older, you have more arousals, and therefore uh, you um, have more choppy sleep, which is sleep maintenance that they've already, the other presenters have talked about. And so when you have more arousals, you have sleep maintenance issues, and you don't have that tight control over those sleep stages that I talked about. It, again, it tends to be more choppy. As a result, you don't feel, wake up feeling like you are ready for life and you're powered and ready to go. You wake up feeling kind of sleepy. And in reality, we're all supposed to wake up feeling very powered and ready to go. So the idea is we have more arousals through time. If you have sleep apnea, you have even more arousals through time as well. So insomnia is a number one problem for any population. It's also a problem for the Parkinson's population. And the idea being is that you have a thing called your predisposed. So there are people who worry more. They're gonna be more predisposed. Then you have an event that takes place. Something happens that upsets you, and you don't sleep very well. Now you develop maladaptive behavior patterns of getting in bed and saying, well, I don't think I'm gonna sleep tonight, and so you're already predicting the worst case scenario, and, and then you get worried about being in bed, and the, ben, the bed's not your buddy anymore, and sleep time isn't friendly, and lo and behold, we've moved ourselves into chronic insomnia, where we're always predicting and anticipating that we're going to have a problem with sleep, and then we do. So how are we gonna address that? Well, we're going to take a look at who gets insomnia, people who worry, and they're more anxious. And they've done so many different studies, and they've found that people who worry more and are more anxious are more vulnerable to having insomnia when there is that precipitating event. So when you treat insomnia, you've got to be kind of like a detective. So you need to say, okay, are you an owl or a lark? So we're all, we're all different. So we're all, we're all either morning people or evening people. Those are your owls versus your lark. And then it can, we can also have people who have actually a circadian rhythm disorder of advanced phase delay or delayed um, sleep phase syndrome. And what you're going to do is you're going to try to figure out exactly the right thing for the individual. And they need relaxation, hypnosis, um, chronotherapy, which is moving the clock back if it's delayed sleep phase, or squeezing sleep if there's anxiety to drop a person into a tighter stage of sleep. 
And the idea of being productive, so you never, ever want to lay in bed waiting to go to sleep. Never lay in bed waiting to go to sleep, because that is how insomnia takes place. So you want to be doing something, so you can do um, some reading that's really boring. Don't be reading a good book or anything like that. So you want, to, you want to read something that's really boring, but at least you're being productive. So you're either learning about something uh, or you're sleeping, but you're not lying there thinking about going to sleep. And then you will naturally go to sleep, because sleep is natural. We all need sleep to live. I mean, they used to basically uh, uh, traumatize people and, uh, and um, punish them by lack of sleep. So sleep is what we all need. Alpha Stim is something that we've been using. Um, it's just a relaxation um, de uh, device that has some research going on right now. So first of all, you want to identify the factors with insomnia. What is stopping that sleep? What is it that's bothering you at night? Are your legs bothering you? You want to rule out the different sleep disorders that are going on. You know, what is it that's, that's causing that? Personality disorders that overlap, if you're more anxious, more depressed, more hysterical. Walk through the basics. You know, basically, are, is, is, do you like your bed? Do you like your mattress? You know, a dark room is better. Some soft down lighting with the rope lighting. Uh, and, you know, time management. And again, you want to rule out the advance and uh, sleep delay uh, phase syndromes. And we all know that depression and insomnia overlap. So basically, sleep hygiene is the big player, and we want to be able to have wake and bedtimes constant. So we all have a routine to get up in the morning. You need a routine to go to sleep at night. That's the idea of it. And there's a consistent routine so that you're shutting down the day and preparing the body for sleep. So these are just general sleep hygiene uh, measures um, that are from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and NIH. So let's talk about being an owl lark. So you may have some genetics. So you may be a morning or evening person, and then it morphs into um, delayed sleep phase, where you're really not tired until 3 o'clock in the morning, and you have normal sleep and wake up at 11 o'clock. Or your um, advanced sleep phase, where basically you go to sleep in front of the television set around 7 o'clock, and you're wide awake at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And what you want to do is try and maintain um, that sleep. So if you're advanced phase, get bright light in the night, so take an evening walk to get some bright light and be outside and do some exercise. We've all heard how great that is. And if you're delayed sleep phase, then we want to turn back the clock a little bit. Uh, unless, of course, you're a musician and you work at night or you're a sleep tech, uh, then you want to be able to turn the clock back so that, uh, depending on what time you have to get up in the morning. So again, um, circadian rhythm uh, is becoming a big deal in uh, Parkinson's. And uh, so there are different ways to do that um, that people have talked about before, which is the melatonin in the morning light and uh, things like that, light at night. So what they're starting to find is that because Parkinson's is neurodegenerative, that the circadian rhythm and, uh, is involved with that, circadian system is involved with that. And so there was a recent study where they're talking about, and this was at the sleep conference this year, um, that, uh, that may be seen as a, a factor in cognitive impairment, benefit with sleep treatment for circadian disorder, and that there's more sleep fragmentation, sleep attacks, sudden sleep. And so again, we're looking more at circadian rhythm specific to Parkinson's. So this is an example of if your bed partner, um, they have strange behavior, they don't remember it, it's part of a dream, and that's that RBD. And, and basically, that's Carlos Shank's work that uh, he had. And we're, again, we're now, it used to be originally it was anybody who got up and acted out their dreams. Now we're looking at RBD involved with any neurodegenerative disorder that's already been indicated to you, but any loss of atonia, so even very vivid dreams where there's any loss of the atonia, they're now looking at as being RBD. Um, the other thing is a, a, a disorder that's been emerging re recently called parasomnia overlap disorder, which is basically in the third stage of sleep. Remember, RBD is in REM, your dream sleep. Um, parasomnias are in your third stage of sleep, which is the deepest stage of sleep. And there's a thing called parasomnia overlap disorder, which looks like RBD, but it's not because it's in stage three. And where somebody's up and they're batting flies, and, and a lot of times they really won't describe so much a dream, they'll just describe to you that they were up um, batting flies and doing different things. And, uh, and so we're looking at that. And there's some different methods that they're looking at for that 
uh, that POD, uh, one of them being hypnosis before you go to sleep and feeding in good thoughts. So there's nightmare disorders that's there, and then sleep terrors. We tend to think of sleep terrors as disorders involving children, but we're seeing more sleep terrors with the adults, and then again that overlap with that parasomnia overlap disorder. So restless legs, creepy, crawly, tinkly sensation, it's worse at night, and um, it's relieved by movement. And so now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is basically the cognitive side of things. So we've talked about anxiety, we talked about depression, we've talked about the sleep, and now we're going to talk about the neurocognitive. And so basically, what we've been tracking is that there's cognitive impairment, and it affects up to 57% of patients within the first three to five years. There's a six-fold increase, as you've already heard, for dementia. And it impacts the memory, attention, executive reasoning. So specific to Parkinson's are these issues that we see, and then that's separate from the Lewy body dementia. So we, all, we see it involving the dorsal attention, bilateral frontal temporal. These are all your dopamine areas in the brain as well, and that's the connectivity. So we've been doing this work for about 15 years. We've been um, working on uh, publishing. This is an online publication doing abstracts um, and keeping a cohort study done since uh, 2011 of what we're seeing overall for dementia. And we're doing uh, neurocognitive training that I'm going to be talking about. So I want to talk about Lewy body dementia. So Lewy body dementia is different from Parkinson's. So you've got Parkinson's dementia that affects memory, executive reasoning, attention, and then you've got Lewy body dementia that has a life all of its own. And the hallmark of Lewy body dementia is a visual perceptual problem as well as a psychiatric problem, and both present very early, and it's an executive reasoning issue. An executive reasoning issue is that governor um, that one of our speakers was talking about earlier. We're, we're all run by the executive reasoning area of the brain. It's like the hub of the computer that runs everything. And so that is what's involved uh, with Lewy body dementia. So this is a case study. So we had a 64-year-old man come in. When he came in, he was already using marijuana. And then he had mixed it with some uh, different drugs as well. And he was having some hallucinations. He, was, um, he called his daughter and said he was at the tree lighting ceremony, but he was actually watching it on TV. And so then he presented at the emergency room. Family history was significant for Alzheimer's. Um, we did um, neuropsychological testing, and we found highly impaired performance, but a specific difficulty with visual processing. So we were trying to figure out, okay, so how much of, because you do have memory problems with marijuana, how much of this is the marijuana, how much of this is his substance abuse that's been going on, you know, how much of this is just plain old dementia, uh, you know, what does this do to? And then, so we found this visual perceptual issue, and then we did a psychological evaluation, and we found that poor contact with reality. So Lewy body is really that paranoid thinking, that poor contact with reality, and the visual perceptual. So his testing, on memory testing, he was below the first percentile on, on all of the measures, except for attention was a little bit better in the third percentile. Uh, and that is the r band So the r bands is a measure of dementia that you can use through time that measures um, the different areas of brain function. And then we did the brief visual uh, memory test, which you have three trials, and you're trying to remember these shapes. And he was um, uh, below the first percentile in all of that. But here is what is so interesting. So this is the design that he's supposed to copy. That was his copy trial. So right away you can see, wow, we got some big visual perceptual issues going on. And of course, you can't remember what you couldn't even copy. So that's not surprising. But that's how we, we knew that we thought we were looking at the Louis body. And then these were the shapes. These are the six shapes he's supposed to remember and their position on the page. And that's what he remembered for the first trial. And then we show him the shapes again. And that's what he remembered on the second trial. Showed him the shapes again. And this was from a different measure. Um, that we had given him, and then that's what he re remembered over time. So it's a very clear example of that visual perceptual. 
So now I'm going to shift from Lewy body into the dementia um, that we see with Parkinson's. Um, this is a mixed picture, though. So this is a man who is 65 years old, master's degree. He had head injury. He had head injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, his, uh, and Parkinson's motoric skills were worsening, and he was not exercising. So we've been evaluating him. We evaluated him in 2015, 2016, and again in 2017. In 2017, we noticed a little bit of decline because he was not exercising, he was not getting out. And uh, so now we have increased the intensity of his therapy and we're on him to get out of the house and exercise more. So here's the picture. So what you can see is that when we started in 2015, he was at the 10th percentile. And so then through time, he went to the 19th percentile and had, a little, uh, uh, had some decline back to the 13th percentile, but still better than 2015 um, for the immediate memory. For visual spatial constructional, um, he stayed the same. He went up in 2016 and then went down. So it really tells you how important it is to uh, get out. And we've been doing cognitive training, and just to um, pause for a minute and talk about that. So our cognitive training are games and exercises that are developed specifically for every individual in our facility. So we do testing first, neuropsychological testing, then we devise an individualized program for that uh, person, and then it's part of a therapy session. So we're addressing anxiety, depression, and we're doing these different games and activities um, to build brain function. And so that's what we've been doing all along. And you can see where his language went from the 12th percentile, then 25th, then 19th. Uh, and then he had uh, some, he was really sliding in terms of the attention. And then the delayed memory actually went up. And the total scale um, it certainly is up from the very beginning. Now, that's the R bands. But let's see what happens. So look what happened on the brief visual spatial. So on that measure, on the brief visual spatial, uh, you see him, uh, he actually went up from the fir below the first percentile to the 75th to the 90th percentile, even despite the fact that he's doing a little bit worse in 2017. And then the overall forgetting score um, went up to a 13, a 75th, and 90th percentile. And in 2015, he was at the 10th percentile. And then on the uh, brief uh, visual uh, memory test, uh, his total recall, he originally was at the 16th percentile, went up to the 66th, went down a little bit here, and then delayed recall, you see him going down a little bit as well. So basically the idea is we need to intensify the treatment, and that's the power of exercise. So it's a nice example to look at, all right, so we can make a difference in cognitive decline with what we're doing, but everybody's got to start to exercise and do more and be active in their everyday life, which also factors in anxiety and depression. So it's a good case example that it's not just what we're doing, it's everything that they're doing in their lives, which are all the modifiable risk factors. Um, so this is another individual. This is a 52-year-old man. Um, with a BA degree, and this is very interesting. So he was seen for six months, from June to December of 2015. He spent the year of 2016 doing rock steady boxing. And then he came back to us in 2017. And so reevaluation showed some very, very nice improvement that actually we're going to take some credit for, but we also have to give credit to rock steady boxing. And, uh, and so we also, so we saw the um, short-term memory went from high average to superior, verbal memory went from average to high average, visual memory went from average to superior, and visual and verbal recognition improved as well. His performance on a measure used to assess dem uh, dementia through time, which was the R-bands, um, improved from below average to superior scoring in 2015 um, to low average to superior in 2017. So we saw some differences. We had a little bit of decline in some of the executive, and uh, now he's back a little more intensively in treatment. So again, it's just, it illustrates the fact that um, the work that we're doing with the uh, cognitive work is holding over time. It also illustrates, again, how important it is to exercise and be working on all the modif modifiable risk factors at the same time. So his visual memory went from the 50th percentile to the 77th percentile. Um, which it went from the average to the high average range, but the verbal memory, which is so interesting, went from the 58th percentile to the 99th point seven percentile. And percentiles are, think of 100 people standing in line, and you're in that position. So he went from position number 58 to position number 99.7. 
Um, attention and concentration went from 91 to 94th percentile. And so you see general memory went from 75th to the 98th percentile. So again, it's a picture where you see that, that cognitive training hold over time, as, as well as, of course, the exercise too. And then again, um, we saw the uh, immediate memory went from uh, the 73rd percentile average to just about above average. The visual spatial did go down a little bit, um, 96 to 92. Language went down from 55 to 34. Uh, the attention went up and delayed memory as well as the total, and the total scale stayed the same. So at the end of the day, there's so much that we can do for Parkinson's with the non-motor symptoms. We can address anxiety. We can address depression. You have mindfulness, hypnosis, relaxation, address the stress. We all know that stress is a modifiable risk factor to make a difference. And again, we're doing the cognitive training to help with dementia and, of course, exercise that's so important. So we've all heard about exercise already today. Uh, this rock steady bo uh, boxing is an international program using non-contact boxing to combat the effects of Parkinson's. A boxing gym offers inspiration, connection, exercises, and really a camaraderie uh, among um, the people that attend that have uh, Parkinson's. And let's not forget about the caretakers. We all know about caretakers, burnout, and stress. So caretakers, any of you who are out there, it's very important that you take care of yourself, whether that be with mindfulness, relaxation, what you need to do, having a day off during the week where you do something for yourself, and being very good to yourself. Um, so there's therapy to address changes in the spouse or partner over time, and the idea is, again, to take care of yourself, the impact of the increased need for care in the ADLs, and the impact of finances, living situation, and so, other, so many other factors. So consider mindfulness, stay in the moment, not in the past, and not in uh, the future. And so we all know that Parkinson's has a devastating effect. There's so much about it that you can't control. Hopefully I've talked with you and conveyed the things that actually you can control and that uh, we're very excited about what we're doing in terms of dementia. Uh, this is the time to take action. It's time to address the non-motor symptoms. I have a 96-year-old aunt who's still walking around in an, of sound mind, and she says to smell the roses. Thank you so much. very important part of the program, which is the role of rehabilitation in managing Parkinson's disease. Um, I was just saying to the ladies who are going to be talking that my father was an expert in uh, physical medicine and rehab, a physiatrist, and he said to me one day, what was I going to do in the future? And I said I was going to be a neurologist, and he thought about that for a minute and said, but you could do something useful. All of you know about LSVT Big and Loud, I think. People come in and ask for it by name. Lee Silverman um, started this thing, and it has a life of its own now. Um, we have here today um, some people from Mary Freebed Hospital, which is part of the Mercy Health uh, System. And we have a couple of speech pathologists, Kim Paz, uh, Pazkowski and Jared Host, we have an occupational therapist, Kaylee Rogers, and two physical therapists, Katie Debkowski and Judy Overmeyer. And they are going to discuss what I think is very important to all of you, and that is the rehabilitation of patients with Parkinson's. We heard earlier on that physical activity is very important. Sometimes physical activity is dangerous if it's not undertaken properly. Sometimes people need assistive devices. They might get hurt doing certain activities. They need guidance as to how to exercise, how to keep mobile, and how to continue with their lifestyle. And that's the information that these uh, individuals have come here to present to us today. And I very much appreciate their coming. One more quick announcement. At the back of your packet, um, behind their presentation, is an e a program evaluation. We'd be very grateful if before you left, you completed it and leave it at our registration desk. Thank you. How is everybody? 
Good. Hopefully you've enjoyed your day. My name is Kim Paskowski. I'm the lead speech language pathologist at Mercy Health Howenstein Neuro Rehab Office. That's a mouthful. <laughs> I'm actually a Mary Freebed employee, as are all of my colleagues. We have the privilege of being contracted to work at Mercy Health. Um, and so the question is quite commonly asked, well, who are you really? Because you'll see us wearing white lab coats with Mary Freebed on it, but name badges with Mercy on it. And the answer is we really are home in both places. So um, we do work at Mercy Health in the Hellenstein building on 220 Cherry. It's at the corner of Cherry and Lafayette, for those of you who are familiar with Grand Rapids. Um, as you pull up into our space, we do have a wonderful valley parking spot that's free for everyone who participates in anything related to Hellenstein and neurology, so that's always a sweet spot too, especially for our patients and their families. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our neuro rehab team. I have um, some wonderful staff. Uh, Katie, Judy, and Renee are all LSBT certified, as well as having a neural specialty um, certification. And then among other things, there's a bajillion other certifications and things that we like to do in our office. So we're not short for expertise. Um, Jared and I both will be LSBT certified by the end of October. Jared is heading out, and then Kaylee was LSBT certified this year as well. So if you're interested in LSBT, you know where to find us. Above and beyond that, we have approximately 40 years of expertise as a team working with Parkinson's disease alone. Um, we're together, we have focused our training and current research and protocols to assist in focusing on the best practice for assisting with things, assisting you and your family members with things like reducing falls, gaining balance, managing dizziness, walking, talking, voice, swallowing, thinking, remembering, reaching into your back pocket, putting on your seatbelt, buttoning your own shirt, using a fork, writing your name, signing a check, tracking your own daily appointments, shuffling cards, reading to your grandchildren, and a million other activities of daily living. Just a quick review. You guys have heard a ridiculous amount of Parkinson's disease today, so I'm not going to beat the bush here. Um, our brain sends signals to our body through dopamine receptors that trigger a limb or body part to move. With Parkinson's disease, the number of these dopamine receptors have decreased. Therefore, they interrupt signal movement and movement of your limbs. Um, the word I like to use is they diminish or make smaller your movements, and therefore everything becomes a little bit more challenging, right? Um, the big fat question today and the reason that we're here is what's the role in rehab? Um, most importantly, once you're diagnosed, your treatment is focused on optimizing medication with your neurologist and then connecting with your multidisciplinary team to get you moving so that you can do a list of all of those things that I had mentioned beforehand. Um, so our goal today is to talk about speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. So without further ado, I'll introduce Jared, who's my partner in crime and speech pathology, and he'll talk a little further about that role. Good afternoon, everyone. As Kim said, I'm Jared, and I work, I'm a speech therapist, and I work at the Howenstein Center as well. And I'm here to touch on speech therapy and Parkinson's and how, those, and how we work with those at the clinic. So when you hear the word speech therapist, typically you think of someone coming into your elementary classroom and teaching you how to make R's or T's or S's. But we kind of focus on two different areas at the clinic and the first of which is voice. And when you talk about your voice, there are several components to it. One is volume. How loud is it at what you're saying, and is it loud enough for everyone to hear it and understand it? The second is pitch or frequency range, and that is the variation of your voice throughout a sentence or a paragraph. Our voice goes up and down, and it adds intonation, which captures emotion and intent. And a lot of times with Parkinson's, we'll see decreased volume, so it's below the average conversational level volume-wise, and we'll also see a decreased pitch. So you have a, a, low voice, a low voice at a monotone volume, and what happens is that voice gets drowned out very easily, especially if you're at a place that has environmental noise to start with, like a family gathering or a restaurant. 
Um, the second thing that we touch on is swallowing or dysphagia. That's a fancy word in the medical world of ha having difficulty swallowing. Um, and there's two aspects of that. There's the oral phase, which is you know, movements of your lips and your tongue and your ability to chew your food up and masticate it. And then there's the pharyngeal phase, which is the actual act of swallowing itself. Um, people can have difficulty swallowing foods, liquids, medications, sometimes saliva itself can become difficult to swallow. And these are some signs to look for. If you're exhibiting any of the signs above, so you'd be a good candidate for some speech therapy. Um, coughing and choking while you're eating foods or liquids. If you swallow and there's a sensation that something is getting stuck in your throat area or just kind of sitting there, or a frequent throat clear <clears throat> while you're eating or drinking items. We also find that people have some difficulty swallowing medication with their liquids. It feels like sometimes it gets hung up in the throat area. In terms um, of voice, like I touched on earlier, decreased volume. Are people asking you to repeat yourself frequently? Um, the gentleman in the top right-hand corner, if anyone's giving you that face, it probably means your volume needs to increase a little bit. Um, the other thing, too, is communicating over the telephone. When we communicate over the telephone, it takes away all of our nonverbals. So if our volume isn't loud enough and we're not able to see the person that we're communicating with, that can create a barrier as well. So if you feel like you need some help with speech therapy, where do I get started? How do I get help? You can um, express those concerns to your primary care physician or if you're a specialist um, from a Parkinson's clinic is following you and just let them know that you maybe are having a change in your voice. You don't feel like it was as strong as it once was or your spouse is asking you to repeat yourself frequently, or maybe you're feeling like you're having some coughing when you're drinking or eating, um, and they will be able to write in order to refer you to get some help. So we're gonna fast forward here a ways, and you've completed your voice treatment or your swallowing treatment, or maybe both. So what's the next step after that? Well, you need to stay on top of the things that you were doing in therapy in order for that to carry over. You can't just go to therapy for a couple weeks and then everything is fine and dandy forever. You have to stay on top of the exercise, stay on top of the vocal warm-ups and all the things that your therapist has given you. Um, I'm horrible with cars. I don't know a ton about engines, but this is the analogy that I use. You don't drive your car for a year and don't change the oil, right? It's kind of the same thing. You want some tune-ups. You need to change the oil, have someone with an objective lens look at where your swallowing is at, look at where your voice is at. And just because you've had therapy in the past and you've had voice therapy two years ago, doesn't mean that you can't have it again. We all kind of need those tune-ups to maintain that level of speech that we're looking at. Um, thank you for letting me uh, speak with you. I appreciate your time, and I'm going to turn it over to Kaylee from Occupational Therapy. Thanks, Jared. Hi everyone, like, the, like they've been saying, my name's Kaylee, I'm the occupational therapist here with the team. So what exactly is occupational therapy? OTs are skilled healthcare professionals that are gonna look at how your Parkinson's disease impacts your ability to move and participate in life. Yes, occupation can mean your job, but a lot of us that aren't working, it really is intended to mean those daily tasks that make up your day that you find meaningful. OTs are gonna to help to restore your independence and your function in those daily activities, so thereby improving your ability to work, play, and live. So what specifically does an OT look at? We're gonna look at those upper body movements. That's your strength, coordination, flexibility, um, and endurance in your arms and hands. We take a close look at your fine motor skills, your hand dexterity. How do you use your hands in everything that you do throughout the day? Activities of daily living, or ADLs, these are activities that you're doing every day, sometimes multiple times a day. Have you noticed any changes with dressing that it's becoming more difficult or slow or less coordinated? Um, toileting, moving around your environment, eating is a large one as well. 
We also look at how visual perceptual skills and cognitive changes can impact the way that you tackle your daily tasks. So how do we accomplish this? There's three things that OTs are going to look at. One is your physical skills. We look at the environment and also the activity itself that we're training. Um, movement and forced exercise repetitively can help to increase the size and the amplitude of the way that you're moving. Another one is to adapt the environment. So we can look at ways of rearranging the setup or using specialized equipment to improve your success with what your, act your goal activity is. Another is to modify the activity itself and do an activity analysis and see if there's a way we can promote success. You or a loved one may benefit from a referral to an occupational therapist if you're having some trouble in these areas that we've been talking about. We know that Parkinson's impacts the size of movement, the speed of movement, the quality of movement. There also may or may not be a presence of a tremor that can impact the way that you perform your activities of daily living. So if you're noticing that you're having increased difficulty with eating, maybe you're spilling your morning coffee when you're pouring it, or um, having trouble getting your fork from the plate into your mouth? Have you noticed trouble with your fine motor coordination? Those are things like buttoning a shirt, tying a tie, pulling your zipper up, um, handwriting, writing a note to a loved one or signing a check for a bill, or sorting through those teeny tiny medications that I'm sure you're familiar with taking. Up to 50% of people with Parkinson's disease have um, some form of joint stiffness that, that these orthopedic issues arise. So we know that a frozen shoulder can happen from all that rigidity in your shoulders from reduced arm swing. So we address how these orthopedic problems can play a role and increase your flexibility and address the joint stiffness. Lastly, positivity is key. Think I can do versus I'll try to do. Really try to develop an activity routine that you enjoy and stick with it. So on that note, let's move a little bit, okay? So we're gonna do a hand warm up, get you all alert and awake right now. So let's hold your hands close to your body, okay? Feel how your hands are, good. And let's reach them out wide, really spread those fingers far. Compare how your left hand and your right hand is. Are those fingers spread as far as you can? Let's do that five times in a row, okay? One, two, three, four, five. Awesome, I saw some great big wide hands out there in the audience. This is a great exercise for all of us to do before we try to tackle buttoning a shirt. All right, on that note, I think that we're all ready to give an enthusiastic and effective high five or handshake to a loved one. All right, up next is Katie with physical therapy. All right, last but not least, we're gonna switch gears and talk about physical therapy. So what is a physical therapist? Physical therapists teach patients how to prevent or manage their conditions. We examine the patient through interview, tests and measures, and different assessments um, to develop a plan and then use treatment techniques to promote the ability to move and restore function. We also have a pretty large role in the proactive um, prevention of loss of mobility by developing fitness routines. The physical therapy world is trying to change how the community views its role, especially with neurological conditions. So if we imagine that of the dental model in our community, when we first move to a new city or we finally get off of our parents' insurance, the first thing we do is try and um, research a new dentist in the area. We then reach out to them, set up your first appointment, become an established patient, and get your baseline assessment. From there, we see the dentist one to two times a year to make sure we can prevent the onset of cavities, um, if something does sneak up on us, they can help us with our oral hygiene. The same idea can be applied to physical therapy. Our clinic recommends within the first year of diagnosis that you meet with our rehab team for that baseline measure. 
From then on, we do annual checkups, which really helps us in that prevention of cavities or problems that might arise along the way, or help you if there are some areas that you can focus your attention on when it comes to developing your exercise routine. So what does a physical therapist treat? We look at balance, both standing still as well as balance with moving. We look at the flexibility of your muscles and the strength of your muscles, especially your lower extremities. We assess your posture and your endurance or your cardiac um, capacity and coordination. We also look at your walking. We know with Parkinson's disease, we have that um, innate slowness that creeps in that makes our walking um, smaller, makes our arm swing go down, reduces our step height and stride length. So those are all things we assess and work with you on, whether that's speed, quality of movement, resuming that arm swing. We also can help with the prescription of um, assistive devices, such as walkers or canes. Some people with Parkinson's also report problems with freezing of gait, where their steps seem to get frozen in place, and no matter how hard they try, they cannot make a turn or initiate a step. Physical therapy can help with that as well. Another common walking problem is festination of gait, where our steps are quick and short, and opposite of freezing, we can't seem to turn them off or stop them, and we get going quite fast. Again, physical therapy can help with that. We assess transfers, whether that's out of chairs, cars, or your bed. We help you with exercise prescription, and again, help you focus on the areas that really need your greatest attention over the next year. And a big one also is fall prevention. Now, specific to neurological disorders and Parkinson's disease is that recalibration of size and movement. Parkinson's makes our signals smaller, thus making all of our movements, voice volume, handwriting, walking, smaller. So one thing that we really weave into all of our uh, treatment plans with our patients is that recalibration of size and movement. So for example, we're going to get you moving again. Keep you awake this afternoon. I want everyone to march in their chair right now. So just lift those knees sitting and march those legs. Good. All right. Now I want you to really march those knees, bringing them up to your chin as high as you can. Put some power into your marching. Good. As soon as everyone really focused on that power and effort, your amplitude doubled in the height that your marches were. That's just one example of how we really, really focus on that muscle memory, that recalibration of your brain to get your size and movement back to normal again. All right, so we have some physical therapy words of wisdom for you. Number one, healthy brains do more with less. Research shows that Parkinson's patients who routinely exercise more are more efficient with their lower levels of dopamine. So while exercise doesn't necessarily improve or increase our dopamine, we are definitely more efficient at using what we have. Number two, timing does matter. The earlier you get, better, or the earlier you get started on an exercise routine and established with a rehab team, the better results you'll have and the safer and more independent you'll be. That being said, number three, it is never too late to start. You might have to put in a little bit more time with your rehab therapist, a little bit more effort, but there's always work that we can help you with. Number four, use it or lose it, or on a more positive note, use it and improve it. The more you work on your sit-to-stand transfers or you work on your um, handwriting, work on your upright posture so you can promote uh, muscle memory and increase flexibility, the better your results will be and the longer the results will last. Number five, exercise must be committed to for the long term. Unlike those who are attending physical therapy for a total knee replacement or an ankle sprain, Parkinson's disease is continuous. It's always there and it's progressive. So unfortunately, this is something you have to really figure out how to weave into your daily routine and commit to for the long haul. That is something we can help you with and hopefully come up with something that's fun and entertaining at the same time. And then finally, number six, Forced, not voluntary, exercise improves motor function. So just like with the marches, um, effort and the amount of uh, power you put into your movements and your exercise does make a difference. There's a lot of research out there, especially with the pedaling for Parkinson's. The more effort you put into stuff, the more that um, Parkinson's brain changes and returns to that normal um, size of movement. 
Um, another interesting fact is that forced exercise in the research shows similar clinical functional MRI responses as the medications. So that, you know, way at the beginning of our presentation on what you can do for your Parkinson's, medication and exercise are both huge components of how you can um, treat this disorder. All right, I'm going to pass off the mic to my colleague, uh, Judy Overmeyer. And I'm having Kaylee come up for a little visual aid and another activity to try after you've all been sitting all day, which is I know the knee space is a little bit short, but if within your ability, scoot towards the front of your chair and sit up nice and straight and tall for a little while. We're going to start at the top and get your necks and heads moving by just doing what I call pigeon pulls or turkey gobbles, which are pull back, pull back, pull back. Now don't hurt your neck, but just keep it back over your shoulders. Now add your shoulders a little bit, come back straight and tall. Answer to yourself, how often do you sit like this during the day? I hear responses, not very often. Now we're going to try a little side-to-side -side weight shifting. So shift on one hip and then shift on the other. Side to side. Now this is something we don't do that often unless you're reaching for a cookie or something like that, which is a good thing to do, I think. If I told you what we've just done is very beneficial for walking and balance, I hope you'd agree with that because it starts with our core, our trunk, our movement. So using those head mo movements, the trunk, to get that going can help your walking and balance. So throughout the day, you can just move forward to the front of any chair, sit up straight and tall, and you're doing yourself a great service for your movement capabilities. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm going to wrap up the whole day's journey uh, with some more tid tidbits about rehab. Um, th th you'll find that throughout your journey of, with Parkinson's, there of course will be changes in what you're emphasizing and what you're facing. And the rehab team is here and present to help you guide you through those changes. Uh, when a persons are first diagnosed, um, we hope to do a lot of education, and these days with the internet, you might find good sources of information, but also some that might be a little bit concerning to you. So going to people who have experienced uh, Parkinson's, who have uh, worked with many people before, can help empower you to know what you're facing, to help manage it. We feel we can help calm and reassure those who are facing the changes of Parkinson's. As has been brought up many times throughout the day, developing an exercise program and protocol that you enjoy and will participate is, will be highly beneficial to you. And so coming to your rehab therapist can help guide you in what works best for you and something that is enjoyable you do f throughout your lifespan. Uh, and finally, as Katie mentioned, getting some baseline measurements of where you're at at the beginning of the journey is helpful for many reasons. One, we may find some mild, subtle changes that have already occurred and that we can impact those and correct them. But also it helps us know down the road what changes have happened or are progressing and then we have more uh, ways to manage those. As time goes by, we are concerned, of course, that Parkinson's symptoms can progress. And as Katie mentioned, earlier is better than later to try to uh, address the changes that have been happening. So coming back to your rehab team uh, saying, yep, I'm having a little more trouble with my handwriting, or yep, my posture's starting to slip a little bit. We have lots of tools to help you address those different challenges. In the middle type time frame, we also would start addressing possibly some safety changes or concerns. We don't want falls, looking at the home situation or uh, work situation on how to address uh, 
changes in balance and security can keep you safe. Adding a few things around the house, such as a grab bar or, or um, something at your uh, bathroom, can help keep you safe and functional. And so we would help look at those type of things, too. As time goes by further and movement becomes more difficulty, difficult, um, then we would help look at compensation or uh, keeping you safe again. Swallowing may become more challenging, so a diet change may be beneficial. You may need help getting in and out of chairs and things, and we would work with your spouses or caregivers to know how to help you the most best. Um, looking at assistive devices, walkers, canes, feeding tools can be helpful. And I call them tools. People tend to push back from using a cane or a walker, but to me they are tools just like a hammer for a carpenter. If they help you keep moving and benefit and from mobility and your activities of daily living, then it's a benefit, it's not a hampering. The main thing I'd like to summarize is we've heard that our neurologists or the movement disorder specialists have so many different things that they're thinking about when you go to see them. They're managing all these medications and all the non-motor symptoms. They might not have some of these basic needs on the front of their brains when they're talking with you. So we want to empower you or your spouse to ask for referrals for therapy. Um, they might not come out and say, yep, it's time for therapy, how long has it been? So feel empowered to ask for a referral if you're starting to notice some changes. I would like to talk a little bit about something, again, you've heard several times today, the LSVT program. Uh, it does stand for Lee Silverman Vocal Training. Back in the late eight, 1980s, somebody with Parkinson's couldn't speak very loud and their family asked what they could do about it. And so speech therapists developed this very intense but effective protocol. It is four times a week therapy with a skilled therapist and then every day you do two sessions of exercise. When you come to see the therapist, you only have to do it one other time. So you're really learning and recalibrating, meaning relearning how big and forceful you either need to speak or move. Um, it is four days a week, um, and then there are two options. The LSVT Big is for the mobility or movement-based program, and physical or occupational therapists lead that. And then the LSVT Loud is the speech or vo voice training. If you're interested in it, um, you can go at the bottom. It says the lsvtglobal.com is their website. And there are many uh, YouTube videos also that show how it's effective and, and so, so forth. It is a good tool. It is a specific protocol of exercises and activities. It is heavily researched as showing being effective. It is not the only tool for therapists, though. And these days, a lot of people are using it and going to the seminars and learning how to do it. But again, if they're an outpatient clinic, mainly treating orthopedic folks, they won't have had a lot of experience with Parkinson's. So we feel that going to a Parkinson's or a neurological-based program will help pull the whole tools together. Some of the pros are it is very intensive, so it really gets a good jump start on getting the movements back to the right size and force. Um, I kind of call it boot camp, but it's a good thing. It is very effective in changing how people move and talk. And there is a significant amount of evidence or research based that it, that it is effective at the time of and following for quite a while. There are some challenges with it, and one of them is it's very intensive. Uh, so some folks who have some orthopedic concerns, such as spine concerns, if they have some cardiac concerns, you need to make sure that your therapist is aware of those and adjusting the protocol appropriately. And of course, if you're going four times a week for therapy, there can be a cost. These days, the co-payments with some insurance, some folks are unable to do that four times a week times four. Um, and Medicare has somewhat of a restriction, but with um, careful monitoring, uh, we're finding that we're able to manage the, the needs for Medicare. 
it won't solve all the concerns. So nothing solves all the problems. And we've found that if there's flexibility restrictions or certain strength deficits, uh, when I was trained, we were told to take care of those first and then do the program. So my concern is that we don't want to cover up impairments by compensating, we want to correct them. So sometimes going for a pre-therapy, again, getting strengthening or flexibility and then doing the program is helpful. Fortunately, there's been a wide growth of opportunities lately for people with Parkinson's to have interesting involvement uh, that are helpful for you. Um, many, many beneficial activities are available. These are some listed in our Grand Rapids area. If you're from out of the Grand Rapids area, I'm sure the uh, Michigan Parkinson's Association has uh, information, as does our West Michigan Parkinson's Association. First on the list, of course, is finding a neurofocus therapy team. Again, if they've only seen one person with Parkinson's a month or every other month, they may not, at a local outpatient orthopedic clinic, they really may not have that much experience. So asking when you're contemplating going somewhere, how many Parkinson's folks have you worked with lately? Um, that can be a good awareness for yourself whether they'll really understand um, some of the intricacies of managing patients. Um, other than that, it's good to find something you're passionate about, or if you don't think you can be passionate about exercise, at least find something that you feel is worthwhile and you can find the benefit on it. It also helps to develop a support network. So by attending something regularly with people that are facing the similar concerns of you, I've just seen this grow in the class I lead. Yeah, they come for class, but they also come to support each other and see how they're doing, and they'll ask where Joe is who hasn't been there for a while. So it's a real good way of developing some comradeship um, in your lifestyle. You'll also learn tricks from other people. You know, We therapists work with people all the time, but those who are going through the Parkinson's and working with it, they'll have many more ideas than we do at times. One thing I would caution is you know your own body, you know your own back, your neck, your shoulder that might have an injury on it. And sometimes in some of the classes I've observed, the leaders tend to be a little bit aggressive or they're leading a class, they can't keep in touch of every person who's doing something. So if you're something doing, if you're participating in a class and the leader is telling you, yep, lift way up or violence on one leg and you know you're not able to do that, be responsible for yourself. You don't have to follow the herd. Do something that feels good and safe for yourself. Sometimes you might have to say no, even though they're saying go. Um, finally, um, that's about our uh, discussion. Uh, again, we're at Mercy St. Mary's here in town. Uh, we do have a table on the, um, back in the lobby with our information of our program. And we're uh, fine to open this up with questions. <laughs>